Aren't you glad to be in church this morning? We love Celebration Sunday. We do it every other month, and it never gets old to hear how Jesus is changing people's lives. In a few minutes, we're going to get to continue celebrating with our friends who are getting baptized today. Let's thank God for each and every one of them. We already had a service where we've already baptized some friends and dedicated some babies to the Lord. There's also baptism happening in Brockton, Massachusetts today, so God's doing awesome things. And we're going to continue our marathon series through the Book of Romans. We have graduated to chapter 3. And uh, as we go into the Word, can we just address the elephant in the room that chapter 1 and 2 has been extremely difficult. I've heard so many feedback. I, people are like, man, I feel like I'm getting beat up every week. And the thing is, the Bible and the Apostle Paul is trying to make a point. He's trying to show you how much you need the grace of God. The whole purpose is to show you, like, listen, you don't measure up. You don't have what it takes. You need this amazing grace that we just sang about. It's more than a song, it's a declaration. I need God's amazing grace in my life. I can't make it without God's amazing grace in my life. And, and so what he's doing, in order to do that, he has to show you how jacked up you are, how jacked up I am. Whether you're religious or irreligious, you need the grace of God. Whether you're atheist, agnostic, whether you're checking it out, whether you identify yourself as such as whatever, uh, you need the grace of God. Can you say amen? And so in chapter 3, what he does is he begins chapter 3 almost like reading the people's thoughts and hearts as they went through chapter 1 and 2. So what he does in chapter 3, he begins by, by saying, listen, I can tell this is, this is intense and you probably have some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and address those questions that I believe you already have. Think about it. He's writing this letter and he's anticipating <laughs> that there's going to be some rebuttals. There's going to be some questions about everything he's addressed in chapter 1 and 2. So that's what chapter 3 is about. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes in the first eight verses. When a pastor says he's going to spend a few minutes, <laughs> pray for him. But we do have baptism, so I'm going to try to condense this uh, as much as I can. So chapter 3, here we go. The Bible says this. It says, then, what's the advantage of being a Jew? Remember, he's talking about, like, the ones who think, oh, we're so special. You know, we're, we're God's people, and we get to go to church. It's like, the irreligious are like, so if they're just like us, then what's the advantage? What's the point, right? Is there any value in the ceremony of circumcision? We talked about circumcision last week, remember? The tender way of cutting off away from God. <laughs> um, so in other words, what, what's the point of all these things we do anyways? But like today, they're going to get baptized. What's the point of that, right? If they're not so special, what's the point? We're going to get to that, right? First of all, the Jews, remember, you can, you can replace Jew for the believer or the Christian. The Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. Verse 3, true, some of them were unfaithful, but just because they were unfaithful, does that mean God will be unfaithful? Another question. Of course not. Even, even if everyone is a liar, God is true. Paul was like, let's just, let's just call it what it is. Okay. Even if everyone lies, God remains true. Are you following? As the scripture says about him, you will be proved right in what you say, and you will win your case in court. We'll get to that in a second. Verse 5, but, after the but, you know, some might say, our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair then for him to punish us? Some are like, yeah, then, then we're helping God. Why would he punish us for that? Okay. We'll get to that in a second. This is merely a human point of view. Of course not. If God were not entirely fair, how would he be qualified to judge the world? But, here's another but. You ever talk to people like everything you say, like, but, but, don't help anybody. But someone might still argue, how can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness and brings him more glory? Like, I'm helping God here. 
And some people even slander us by claiming that we say, Paul was like, even some people are putting these words in my mouth by saying, the more we sin, the better it is. Those who say such things deserve to be condemned. That is the word of the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. So it's been a challenge this last couple of weeks because what the Bible does is God puts a mirror in front of us. The problem with us is we want binoculars to look at others. God's like, no, my word is a mirror to look at yourself. And the more you look at yourself, the less time you have to be looking at other people. Can you say amen? So that's why it doesn't feel good, right? When you see your blemishes, when you see, you know, I got, I got, I got, I got, I got stuff going on here that doesn't make me very comfortable. But the point is, you don't grow in comfort. You grow in being challenged. And when it comes to God's righteousness, Paul wants to make it clear. And if you haven't noticed yet, his point is, no one has a leg to stand on. Every single person falls short from the irreligious to the religious. Okay? He wants to make sure, hey, the playing field is level. All fall short of God's glorious standards. All are sinners in need of grace. In other words, we all need Jesus. Can we agree on that? <laughs> we just, all of us needs Jesus. And so Paul knows sinful nature, right? He knows that people will love to continue to find justifications, will love to continue to find reasons, right? Behind every but, there's the truth, right? So Paul, knowing that, he's like, I can anticipate that based on what I shared with you so far in Romans 1 and 2, you're going to have some questions. And so I want to go ahead and try to address some of those questions because I know for a fact that your sinful nature will kick and scream against the Word of God. Are you tracking so because I have to baptize, I'm going to jump right into this so we don't, we, don't, we don't spend too much time here. But number one question, he says, look, then, then what's the point of being a Jew? What's the point of being religious if, if it doesn't make you any special, any better than, than anybody else? In other words, today we would say like this, what's the point of going to church? What's the point of growing up in, in a religious environment if it doesn't make you any better than anybody else. And there's a struggle in our society right now with church and religion. We know, all know that, right? And so it's important to understand here the power of being in God's Word. Because Paul says it here, he says, look, there is great benefits. First of all, the Jews or the believers were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. First of all, if you're taking notes, man, you, if you grew up in, a, in an environment where there was some Bible, there was some religion, there was some church, man, you've been entrusted with such a great privilege. It is a, an incredible privilege to have the revelation of God because the truth be told, not everybody has it. One of the things that I will never take for granted, take lightly, is the fact that, that we have right now hundreds of students from babies all the way to junior high school receiving lessons in the grace of God, in the will of God, because that's going to set them up to be better than those who don't have that. So you can't take that lightly. What a privilege, what an honor it is to be able to be entrusted with the Word of God. And I want to share a few benefits because sometimes I think we forget. Human beings, man, we have amnesia. Did you know that one of the most used words in the Bible is the word remember? Why? Because we forget. We forget how blessed we are. We forget how good God's been to us. We forget that without those foundations, we would not be what we are today in life. First of all, the Word gives you a great foundation for life. It sets you up on a path that most people don't have. Just to have the basic understanding of, of that there's a God. There's the basic understanding that, that there is such thing as commandments. It's the basic understanding that there is such thing as right and wrong. And, and remember that GPS that's inside of you that screams at you and lets you know, hey, you're about to make a bad move here, knucklehead. Like, thank God that there is a GPS system that is built inside of you <laughs> to keep you from a lot of trouble. Is anybody grateful that even when you didn't 
get the full revelation, but you had enough sense to know some things are not for me. Right? I, I will forever be grateful for my grandmother for taking me to Sunday school and for my two aunts for taking me to Catholic Mass. And you know, growing up, I said my denomination was Catherine. I was half Nazarene, half Catholic. And even though I didn't fully understand the relationship with Jesus, but man, it gave me enough foundation to know that, man, there are some things that I won't do because it will get me in trouble. Like, I don't know if you've ever been there, like where in, in your knucklehead days, where you know you're about to make a bad move, and that GPS is faithful to be like, wrong, wrong, wrong. You're about to get arrested, wrong. Get away from here, wrong. Is anybody thankful that you had enough sense? Like, that foundation kept you from a lot of crazy. And some of us, sometimes, we should just thank God for the things that he kept you from. Because you have no idea. Where you, look, you could have been two moves away from being homeless. Two moves away from being arrested. Two moves away from moving on your family if it wasn't for God's guardrails. See, the struggle we're having right now in our society is we want to remove every guardrail that God put in place. Which is crazy because guardrails are actually there to protect you. Like, like, God forbid you get into a car accident. Hopefully you hit a guardrail and it brings you back to the main street. That's what God is trying to do with his commandments. No commandment blesses God but you. Every guardrail that God put in place is to bless you. But we are so dumb, we think, I need to remove them because I'm not free. And what are we doing right now? We're trying to remove every guardrail, right? The guardrail of police. We're like, we don't need police. It's like, what are you, an idiot? God rails of teachers and parents. God rails of gender. All the stuff that God put in place. We're like, we don't need it. We don't need it. We don't need it. We don't need it. And my, I ask, how are we doing? How are we actually doing without the God rails that God put in place? How are we actually doing without his command? Like every command of God, go look it up, is for your own good. God does not benefit from every one of those commands. Every God wills to bless you. Imagine right now you decided we don't need stop signs. We don't need stop lights. We don't need any of those things. Why? Because we're free. <laughs> How crazy it would be. But this is what we're doing. Without God, we don't have common sense. To understand that every God will is blessed. If you go home today, you decided, you know what? It's aquarium. It's detrimental to Nemo's freedom. I need to free Nemo. <laughs> and you take Nemo out of his aquarium and you free Nemo, what you do? You actually killed Nemo because the guardrail of the aquarium is good for Nemo. Nemo needs water. Nemo needs to be inside of an aquarium. <laughs> so now picture that into life. Every guardrail is there to actually bless you. Not to hinder you. It's to prosper you. To give you hope and a future. But we have the wrong perspective when we think, oh, God is trying to hold things from me. When he told Adam and Eve, you, shall, you will die if you go outside of my guardrails. He wasn't joking. And my, I ask again, how are we doing when we remove God's guardrails? Not good. So Paul knows that, like, hey, I can anticipate that you might think this the wrong way. What is, what is the thing that the word does? The word improves your life when you believe it. When you actually believe it, man, the word makes your life better. I will go to the grave with this conviction that Jesus makes me better at living, and I'm better at life because of Jesus. <laughs> you... I'm about to be 45 in a couple of weeks, which is like, whoa, what the heck? <laughs> Where'd time go? As, as I stand here as 45 years old, there's nothing you can convince me that there's something better than Jesus out there for me. Right. <laughs> Listen. I'm a better person because of Jesus. I'm a better father because of Jesus. I'm a better husband because of Jesus. I'm a better friend because of Jesus. I, I take care of my money better because of Jesus. I invest because of Jesus. I'm a pastor because of Jesus. There's nothing in my life that I don't see the goodness of Jesus in it. Right. Right. Like, listen, this is not a religion for me. 
That's why most people don't get it. Because you're treating it like it's a religion. Man, this is a lifestyle that blesses you when you live it. Listen, to know Jesus, my friends, is to have eternal life. See, the thing is, if you're religious, you think eternal life means, oh, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. No. To know Jesus is to know life right now. See, what happens to you after you die is just a continuation which you begin here. So eternal living is right living, is righteous living, is holy living, is prosperous living. In every sense of the word, to know Jesus is to have eternal life right this moment. I'm not waiting to go to heaven. Heaven comes to me because I have Jesus in me. When we pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, we're saying bring heaven now. Man, you can't tell me nothing that, that you, you can do life better without Jesus. You can pretend. That's a whole other conversation. But listen, to know Jesus is to have eternal life. All of these scriptures, every single thing written here is to bless your life. Even the parts that you don't like. It's all for you. Paul, speaking to one of his protege, he's mentoring a young man named Timothy. He says this about the word of God. He says, look, in 2 Timothy, he says, all what? Say it like you mean it. All? All of it, from Genesis to Revelation, okay, is inspired by? And is what? To what? What? Because you fall for lies. You ever lie to yourself? Don't. Tell the truth in church. <laughs> you ever convince yourself of something? Amen. And then later you're like, what the heck was I thinking? It's like, yeah, you. <laughs> the mirror comes up. You're out here like, he's like, no, no, put the mirror up. What is true and to make us realize what is? Wrong. Oh, we don't like that. You tell me what's wrong. <laughs> I'm all that bag of chips. <laughs> yeah, you, you're the wrong kind of chips. And then he what? It what? Ooh, say it like you want to be correct. It corrects, it corrects us when we are wrong. wrong, 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 wrong. Yeah, I told her. The Holy Spirit was like, wrong, 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 wrong. I do whatever I want. Wrong, 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 wrong. And it teaches us to do what is for your own good. All of it. There's nothing you will read here that will bless God. It will bless you. Every single part of this is to bless your life. So if you're a smart person, you will immerse yourself in the Word of God because the Word of God will actually bring you life. And you will embrace the teaching, but also you will embrace the correction. You will embrace the rebuke. You will embrace all of it because you know, man, it's all to benefit me. Nobody else. But here's the thing, it only works if you work it. Can we say that together? It only works. So let's flip it and reverse it. No, Missy Elliott, no. <laughs> okay, I just, I, I grew up in the 90s, you know. Yeah, shit, okay, all right. We're just gonna flip it and reverse it, okay. My friends, don't take God's word for granted. And seriously, don't take church for granted. God created a place for us to be able to gather together his people to spur each other on into his will and his purpose. And there's a lie out there right now that says, I don't need to go to church, to which I say, yeah, that's crazy because I don't need to go home to be a husband either. I don't need to be home to be a father either, but I love my family. I want to be around my family. I want to build my family. I want to bless my family. The church is the God's family. Don't let the enemy lie to you that you can do this on your own. In about a few weeks, I don't know, in probably 45 weeks, we'll be in Romans 12. <laughs> the way we're going. But in Romans 12, Paul says, don't conform to the ways of the world, but be transformed. How? By renewal of your mind, then you will be able to test and know what is God's pleasant, 
perfect in goodwill. When you get into the word, man, you're renewing your mind. When you renew your mind, you renew your thoughts. When you renew your thoughts, you're, re you're renewing your feelings. When you renew your feelings, you renew your actions. When you renew your actions, you renew your reactions. And the word of God permeates you to such a degree that you begin to live this thing. I hate it when people reduce this to a religion. Because it's way more than that, man. It's life-giving. He gives you life, man. When I go to this thing, man, I feel like it's equipping me. It's strengthening me. Like, I, you probably heard me say this to, before. Like, when I read the word, man, I feel empowered. Like, I mean, I'm one of those dudes in 300. I feel like my spiritual abs are like, like I'm ready to go. Don't mess with me in the spirit, man. I will jack you up. <laughs> Only in the spirit, though. I'm not... I don't want the smoke in the physical. I'm good. I'm 45. I got five kids. So I <laughs> don't need it. I want to the, I wanna fight the right battles. <laughs> fight the right battles. I told someone, I was like, listen, I don't mind dying. I just don't want to die over something stupid. <laughs> Anybody got that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Pick and choose your battles. I don't want to die over something stupid. I'm hoping to be around long enough to rock in PJs and see grandkids. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I, I hope Jesus gives me that blessing. <laughs> question number two. Question number two, because we got to go. We got friends to baptize. <laughs> Look at verse three and four. He, en he, en he, he sees another rebuttal coming. He says this. He says, look, true, some of them were unfaithful. Talking about the believers. But just because they were unfaithful, does that mean God will be unfaithful? Of course not. Even if everyone is a liar, God is true. See what I mean? He's doing there. In other words, the way we would, the question that we would have today is, what about all the hypocrites? What about all the ones who are supposed to represent God and, and we found out that they have a double life and, and, you know, the pastor's weird and he was doing shady stuff and all this. Like, we can, we can, we can get... Stumped by that question. And a lot of people will use that question. But here's the thing that Paul is establishing here. Did you catch that? He says, yeah. But this, here's the problem. The problem is everybody's a hypocrite. Including the person who says, what about the hypocrites? He is, he's saying, hey, listen, let everybody be a liar. Only God be true. And the truth be told all of us have been hypocritical at some point in our lives. We've all have said things we shouldn't have said. We've all have done things we shouldn't have done. So in other words, we all qualify as hypocrites. And as the kids would say, it takes one to know one. Right? So when someone says that, it's, it, it doesn't mean anything because we're saying, yeah, you're right. That's why we all need Jesus. And we all need his grace. Because he's the only perfect one. Again, Paul speaking to his protege, Timothy, he says this. He says, look, look, if we are unfaithful, he, God, remains, for he cannot deny who he is. So only he is faithful. So being a hypocrite is being human. But God is faithful to his word. So here's my advice for all of us. Don't focus on others. Make sure that you're, right, you're in right standing with God. Put down the binoculars. Put up the mirror. Because here's the thing. When you stand before God, he's not going to ask you about the guy who said everybody's a hypocrite. Matter of fact, the guy who says everybody's a hypocrite is going to have to answer for his own hypocrisy. Remember, God won't judge you not even based on his standards. He judges based on your standards. So don't focus on others. Focus on being the right standing with God. I love the Bible because it's so practical. It's so real, right? Jesus was having a moment with his disciples when he came back from the dead. And you know the story. Peter from New Bedford <laughs> denied Jesus three times. And he, he saw from the hood that he had a knife and he cut someone's ear off. He's from New Bedford. I know for a fact. 
And they're having a conversation because now he feels remorse and, we, and you know, he know what he did was wrong. And Jesus comes to, to reestablish their relationship. And, and he talks to Peter in a very, very deep, personal way and asking him three times, Peter, do you love me? And Peter knew, man, you cut it right through me, man. I'm, I'm, uh, you know everything about me. Of course I love you. So, so Jesus says, then, then, then do what I'm asking you to do. And, and Jesus begins to prophesy over him and said, Peter, it's going to be a tough road to ride. I got some stuff for you to do, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be challenging. Peter actually, history records that Peter later on would see the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus. He was crucified upside down. And the reason why he was crucified upside down is because he said, I'm not worthy to die like my Savior. But the point is this. In that moment, Peter was receiving a prophetic word from Jesus, but he's so caught up on others that he looked around, he looked at John, and he goes, okay, what about him? And you know what Jesus said? Go look it up. John 21, go, you go home. You know what Jesus said? Mind your business, Peter. What I got for him is for him. What I got for you is for you. I got news for you, church. Mind your business. Mind your business. What did you learn in church today? I need to mind my business. I need to put the mirror up, put the binoculars down. By the way, I heard someone say something that, you know, the punk in me loves these things. Someone said, you know, not go into church because of hypocrites. It's like saying, I'm not going to go to the gym because there's overweight people there. <laughs> Somebody will wake up tomorrow and go, I am a hypocrite. <laughs> I got to go on because we got guys to baptize and ladies to baptize. Question number three, look at verse five and six. Another question comes up. He's anticipating this question. He says, but... Some might say, our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. It isn't, isn't it unfair then for him to punish us or judge us? This is the question of if, hello. <laughs> I'm telling you, every week has been hard. I, I can understand how you're feeling, sister. You know, I feel you. Let's pray together. <laughs> but listen, this is the question of, if God is so loving, then why would he punish people? Why would he judge, right? This is a big one nowadays. It's not fair for God to judge people, which is really funny because we all like judgment. We do it all the time. We just don't want judgment to come to us. The reality is we are so judgmental that it's become normal to us. That it's abnormal in God's economy. If you have a Twitter account, you're a judge. Twitter has decided who to cancel, who not to cancel. What is that? That's saying, I'm the judge. I don't like what you did. You're canceled. I'm a judge. You got a Facebook account? You're a judge. How many times have you gone on Facebook and put it out there, who you're judging today? By the way, Facebook is owned by moms now. <laughs> All the millennials left. Moms are like, we got this. <laughs> You got an Instagram account, you've judged. You've judged me today. Some of y'all are like, as a pastor, where's, where's the shirt and tie? <laughs> to which I reply, no, you got to go deeper. Where's the robe and sandals? <laughs> you, didn't judge, you didn't judge long enough. You got to go deeper. I'm still waiting for someone to show me what does a pastor look like. You hear it all the time. People judge all the time. Yeah, we look at this church. We think they are. Look at this stuff. Look at this stuff. Look at this stuff. <laughs> How about we put a spotlight on you? What are we going to find? See, biased judgment is no judgment at all because it's never perfect judging. We have a court system. Paul says we have a court system. The court system is imperfect. How many people have you known I've heard about who went to court and was judged unfairly. There are people in prison because the judge is imperfect, the lawyers are imperfect, the witnesses are imperfect. Sometimes this, the evidence is imperfect. We've seen people go free who should have been locked up. We've seen people get locked up who should have gone free. Why? Because it's imperfect. It will always be imperfect when you have a system that is flawed by sinful nature. 
So every judgment you render is going to be imperfect because you are an imperfect judge. So judgment is necessary because if there's no judgment, there's no justice. Would you want someone to get away with something that they did to you? You'd be like, no, that's not right. It's not fair. You just don't want that to be reciprocated to you when it's your turn to be judged. So we listen, the problem with us is we think we're not as bad as others, but here's the thing. God doesn't compare you with others. He compares you with his son. And you have no leg to stand on. It feels good to compare yourself with someone that you feel is inferior to you. <sighs> not you. You don't do that. But God is just. He's so just. You know what he did? Knowing that we all deserve judgment. What does he do? He says, I'm going to send my son to take your judgment. That's crazy. See, when people think God's not fair, God is beyond fair that he would send his son to take the punishment that you and I deserve. It's like going to court knowing that you're guilty and the son gets up and says, Father, I know he's guilty, but I'm willing to take the charge. That's what Jesus did on behalf of every single human being. The most famous Bible verse is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But here's the thing. I was telling, I was telling a group of people yesterday, like, when you're reading the Bible, you got to read the whole thing. Don't just pick and choose. Because you got to keep reading. This same Jesus who said that, look what he says. Watch this. Look, he keeps going. Same moment. He goes, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been for not believing in God's one and only son. In other words, he gave you an out and you didn't take it. And the judgment is based on this fact, not feelings. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. In other words, we're so bad, we rather do our own thing than do God's will. Keep going. Watch this. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for, their fear, for fear that their sins will be. None of us want to be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Did you get that? So God is so fair so just that he's like, hey, I'll put it on my son and he will credit his righteousness on you, but it's up to you to apprehend yourself of that credit. Or you can live on your own, which, by the way, you already stand condemned. There's nothing you can do to get you outside of that, outside of accepting the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So God is way more loving than any humanity put together. Put us all together, we will never be as just as God will ever be. Because we will always be biased with our judgment. So my friends, this is a moment in the service that you got to think, am I putting my trust in Jesus or do I think I'm going to make it? If you're not putting your trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're already condemned. God brings moments like this to say, hey, pay attention. I'm loving, I'm kind, I'm, pa I'm, I'm, I'm patient, but one day it's going to run out. And you don't want to find yourself on the wrong side of grace. So put your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. It says don't harden your heart if you heard God's word. Yield to it. Yield to it. Today you're going to hear in a second testimonies of people who are not perfect, but they met a perfect Savior who has taken them and has shaped them, is molding them. And the Bible tells us that we overcome by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Today you're going to hear again and again. You know what the common denominator is? They don't even know each other, but they know Jesus. Some of them have never met each other, but you're going to hear a common denominator, but Jesus, but Jesus, but Jesus, but Jesus, but Jesus, but Jesus. He's the only one qualified to save. And it leads me to the last question today. Verse 7 and 8. 
one more rebuttal that we all have. He says, but someone might still argue, how can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness and brings him more glory? That's another word of saying, well, then guess I'm helping God out when I sin. Like, if God is so loving and good, then every time I sin, I'm just highlighting the fact that he's amazing. To which I say, my friends, you can make a mess of things. Yes, God is in the business of fixing things. But when you don't apprehend yourself of his grace and you take it, for, you take it late, you take it for granted, that's like saying, Jesus dying on the cross, eh, not that big of a deal over my sins. We call that cheap grace. We call that a deluded version of the real thing when you take God's grace for granted, when you think you can keep doing your thing because he's just going to forgive you. No, my friends, you keep doing your thing. He says he is patient, but he's also a judge. See, everybody wants to highlight God's love, but go read again this thing. God is also holy, righteous, just. He won't put up with sin forever. He nailed your sins on the cross, not for you to take it lightly, take it for granted and think, oh, I can just keep doing whatever. I, w- I want to warn you as a pastor, I love you. You keep sinning, you might go to hell. You keep taking it lightly, you will go to hell. And you're like, a loving God will send me to hell. No, you were going to send yourself to hell. He already made provision for you not to go to hell. But you keep messing around like we got time. Only today is guaranteed. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. The last two weeks, man, we, we've buried six people. In the last two weeks. Some completely out of nowhere. And I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm saying that to scare you. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Don't mess around with sin. You might find yourself on the wrong side of the tracks. I'll leave you with a powerful statement by a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German scholar who lived during the Nazi regime. He wrote a great book called, if you want to read a great book on this, called The Cost of Discipleship. And he says this, he says, look, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. In other words, oh, you don't have to repent, you're fine, you're good. No, that's cheap grace. Repentance is the prerequisite for forgiveness. Repentance is a change of mind. Metanoia, like I can't keep living like this. Baptism without church discipline. You're going to get baptized today, my friends, and out of love, right? You're welcome into the family of God. But if you act a fool, we're going to call it out because we love you, and God calls us to do that. The pastor that married my wife and I said to us, he said, anyone who walks into my church becomes my business because I have to answer to God. Cheap grace is communion without confession. You, you can take communion for granted. Paul says even some have died because they took communion for granted. Absolution without, pers- without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. In other words, you keep coming to church, but you're not becoming more like Jesus. You're taking God's grace for granted. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Strong warning. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Save the wretch like me. Not to take it for granted. Not to take it lightly. Because, man, what a price. A perfect person had to die on my behalf. Because I don't have what it takes. I don't know how you feel, but when I sin, I, I can't wait to repent. Because I don't want to have one moment out of harmony with my Savior, with my Lord. So we are the problem, my friends. Jesus is the solution. It's not, it's not cheap grace. It's costly grace. Right. Cost him his life to give you life. Cost Jesus' his life on the cross. When you take sin lightly, it shows that you don't fully understand and appreciate his love for you. Because here's, here's what true grace will do. It leads to lasting transformation. 
You, there's no way you can accept the grace of God and stay the same. Even if you tried, you couldn't. It's too good. One of my favorite pastors says, he says, God loves you just the way that you are, but he loves you too much to leave you where you are. I believe you're going to come through these waters today. Man, it's the beginning of greater things to come. But it won't be easy. You got to carry your cross and follow Jesus. Stay with me as we pray this morning.